Good morning. And welcome to worship on this very hot day. <laughs> we're celebrating the second Sunday after Pentecost. So we're glad that you're here with us. If you're new with us, uh, uh, this is the first time with us this morning, we invite you to sign our welcome books at either of the entrances. And we welcome the online um, people worshiping with us through Niagara Online. We're delighted you've chosen to worship with us today. Following the Spirit of God is alive and present in this place. And you, my friends, are the body of Christ for this time and in this place. Let us begin our worship by singing together. We are summoned here by our holy God. From classroom and kitchen and carpool, we are all young and old and middle aged, individuals and families, spoken and outspoken. The house of worship is a place to pursue God's vision. For all people. Let us pray together. As on the first day you began the work of creating us, as on the first day you raised your Son from the dead, so on this first day, O oh Lord, freshen and remake us. And as the week is new, let our lives begin again, because of Jesus, who shows us your love and power. Amen. As we gather this morning, the peace of Christ be with you.
Well, good morning. Oh, come on. It's sunny out there. Let's bring the sunshine in here. Good morning. Good morning. All right. That was better. So how's everyone today? Good. Doing well? Good. Well, this morning in the scripture reading, it's going to be read here in a few minutes. We're talking about faith and trust. And it is considered, too, as a special kind of believing what is believing? Does anybody know what believing is? Oh, is it, is it like, are we having a touch? Or like, your body is a, a person's health? Or your blood? Or is it blood? Yes, yes. Believe. Yes, when you get a cut, you're covered in blood. Yes, that's believing. That's believing, yes. Um, believing is like, if you're not sure that you're going to like, do it, but you still believe in yourself. Very good. That's well said. Believing that you're going to do something, but how was it again? Believing that you're going to do something? Yeah. Like, no. You're going to believe that you, like, you're not sure if you can do it, but you still... Not sure if you can do it, but you, you know that you can, yeah. but you're not sure how well. All right. I need a volunteer this morning. So who would like... Do you want a volunteer? Okay. Come on over here. Come on over here. We're going to... Just for a second here. I know I didn't expect it to be so warm today. This is wool. I'm sorry. You don't have an allergy to wool, do you? No. All right. Okay. Cover your eyes. Okay. 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 We're going to cover you up like that. Okay. Can you see anything? No. No. Okay. Do you think you'd be able to walk and not hit anything? Yep. Yeah? You think so? Well, here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you. We're, we're just going to walk around here a little bit. And uh, do you, do you uh, have trust in me? Yes. Yes? Yes? Do you have faith in me that I'll steer you uh, without bumping into anything? <laughs> no answer. My goodness. That doesn't say much, does it? You're slowing down here. You don't have trust in me? Yeah? Okay. Very good. All right. We'll take this off. We'll take this off. All right. So how was that? How was that experience? How would you feel? Yeah, <laughs> a little nervous. You 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 had faith that I could steer you, but you were sort of. Do I trust him to not steer me in the wrong direction? Is that be, would that be po possible? What you're thinking? Yeah, it would be. But anyway, God leads us through life, and this is how He leads us through life. And sometimes we are unaware of dangers or problems around us, but God is always there helping us through them. We can have faith in God. Faith is believing something you can't necessarily prove, sort of like what you said earlier. You know, in the Bible, there is a, uh, a verse through Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, where it says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. So basically, faith is something that we know is there, but sometimes we can't see it. And the Bible says that faith is given to us by God, but it is something you may have to practice for, for it to feel natural, like, uh, like things you have to practice. What are some things you have to practice? Do you play an instrument? You have to practice riding a bike. You have to practice riding a bike, that's right, so you don't fall off. Or, you know, practice playing an instrument or, or even doing your homework to learn. Practice, learn how to write. I'm sorry? Soccer? Yeah. Yeah. That's right, soccer. God wants us to live in faith. God loves us and he can do all things. This means that God is always able to take care of us so we can trust God. When we go through our days trusting God and knowing he will help take care of us, that is living in faith. Jesus told his disciples to have faith or believe in God. When we live in faith, we are blessed. When we trust God, you know, not a whole lot, but even if we trust God a little bit, we find out that he keeps his word and this helps us trust him even more the next time. You know, the Bible is a great book to read because it is full of stories of how people had faith in God and he blessed them for it. So now let us have a word of prayer and thank God for that. Dear God, thank you that you love us. Thank you for giving us faith. Thank you that we can know you and that we can trust you. This we ask in your name, and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught all his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, that was lovely. I'm going to invite Helen Ray to come forward on behalf of the Legacy Committee.
Did you notice that all the lights in the ceiling are, are working? Quite a number have burned out over time, particularly in the choir area. And so they have all been replaced with LED bulbs that will last for many, many, many years. And thank you to the choir who donated $1,000 towards the approximate $10,000 cost. <laughs> As well, Ruby Carroll Hall has been re-roofed with a steel roof that has a 50-year warranty. There are photos of the installation progress of both of these projects on display in the Ruby Carroll Hall this morning. Look inside the green legacy gift brochure and peruse the list of legacy gift donors. Thanks to these generous individuals who arranged to make a gift through their will during the past 12 years, they have paid it forward so that today's congregation did not have to fundraise for these major projects. We can devote our energy to presently go about the mission God has set out for us. What a fortunate congregation we are indeed, and we should never forget their philanthropy. Please take home this brochure and read it carefully. It can be very satisfying to make a legacy gift. You are encouraged to speak to any member of the Legacy Gifts Committee, David Anderson, Nola Brown, Alan Halfyard, John Jansen, Reverend Jeff Mason, Bob Tucker, and myself. We have available an excellent and very helpful will workbook with information and work pages, worksheets that um, can help work through the process of, uh, of making a will. There are a few available today or uh, contact the office to get a copy. The back page of the brochure gives specifics for le legacy giving support at United Church head office. And next month, Reverend David Jagger begins as a gift officer for Hamilton Conference a resource person to contact for assistance in making a legacy gift. Inside the cover of the brochure is a list of large expenses funded by legacy gifts in the past six years. Today, we acknowledge and rejoice in the two most recent items enabled by the generosity of legacy donors, the Ruby Carroll Hall roof and the sanctuary and narthex relamping. Let's gather in prayer. O creator of all life, you have promised to be present wherever two or three are gathered in your name. We, the people of this community of faith, are grateful for those who have left a legacy so we can complete projects. We give thanks for the relamping of our sanctuary that enables us to provide a space for worship and offer opportunities to partner with our local community. We also appreciate the new roof so we can provide a space for ministry and mission where all are welcome. Ever-present God, fill us with your love as we celebrate these gifts of legacy that enable us to do your mission and ministry in your name. Amen. Our reading today is from the Old Testament book of Daniel, chapter 3, verse 1 to 30. The Golden Image. King Nebuchadnezzar made a golden statue whose weight was 60 cubits and whose width was 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent for the satraps, the prefects, and the governors the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to assemble and come to the dedication of the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces assembled for the dedication of the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. When they were standing before the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, 
that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, an entire musical ensemble, you are to fall down and worship the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, an entire musical ensemble, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshiped the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Accordingly, at this time, certain Chaldeans came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, an entire musical ensemble shall fall down and worship the golden statue, and whoever does not fall down and worship shall be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These pay no heed to you, O king. They do not serve your gods, and they do not worship the golden statue that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought in. So they brought those men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods, and you do not worship the golden statue that I have set up? Now if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, an entire musical ensemble to fall down and worship the statue that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. And who is the God that will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense to you in this matter. If our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and out of your hand, O king, let him deliver us. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods, and we will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was so filled with rage against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face was distorted. He ordered the furnace to be heated up seven times more than was customary and ordered some of the strongest guards in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to throw them into the furnace of blazing fire. So the men were bound, still wearing their tunics, their trousers, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the furnace of blazing fire. Because the king's command was urgent and the furnace was so overheated, the raging flames killed the men who lifted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But the three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound, into the furnace of blazing fire. Hearing them sing and amazed at seeing them alive, King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up quickly. He said to his counselors, was it not three men that we threw bound into the fire? They answered the king, true, O king. He replied, but I see four men unbound, walking in the middle of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the fourth has the appearance of a god. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the door of the furnace of blazing fire and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire, and the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair on their heads was not singed, their tunics were not harmed, and not even the smell of fire came from them. Nebuchadnezzar said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. They disobeyed the king's command 
and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree, any people, nation, or language that utters blasphemy against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other god who is able to deliver in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. The late Tim Hansel was an inspirational speaker and a Christian author. And he had told a story about the day that he and his son, Zach, were out in the country, climbing around in some cliffs. He heard a voice from above him yell, Hey, Dad, catch me! He turned around to see Zach joyfully jumping off a rock straight at him. The only problem was he did not realize Zach had first jumped and then yelled, Hey, Dad! Tim became an instant circus act, catching Zach. They both fell to the ground, and for a moment after Tim caught Zach, he could hardly talk. When he found his voice again, he gasped in aspiration, Zach, give me one good reason why you did that. Zach responded with remarkable calmness, Sure because you're my dad. Zach's whole assurance was based on the fact that his father was trustworthy. He could live life to the hilt because his father could be trusted. In our text for today, we hear how Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego trusted their heavenly father. Regardless of the outcome, they were willing to be thrown into a fiery pit and trust God with their outcome. In a book entitled, We Let Our Son Die, 
Larry and Lucky Parker recount the tragic story from 1973 of a misguided faith. In painful and painstakingly detail, Larry and his wife portray the picture of how they had come to believe that if they, had, if they just had enough faith, God would heal their diabetic son. Eventually, their son Wesley got so sick he needed insulin. Believing that God would heal Wesley, they withheld the insulin, and predictably, Wesley lapsed into a diabetic coma. The Parkers, warned by some members of the church, they were warned by them about not having enough faith. They should believe that God would heal Wesley. Unfortunately, Wesley had died. But even after Wesley's death, the Parkers, undaunted in their faith, conducted a resurrection service rather than a funeral service. In fact, for more than a year following his death, they refused to abandon their, their firmly held faith that Wesley, like Jesus, would rise from the dead. Eventually, both Larry and Lucky were tried and convicted of manslaughter and child abuse. What a horrible, tragic story this is. But even more tragic is how many countless other stories like this have been painfully retold. In many cases, the moral is the same and described as a flawed concept of faith that inevitably leads to shipwreck, sometimes spiritually, in other cases physically, and in still other scenarios both. Many Christians believe that the Bible teaches that faith is confidence in a certain outcome. Christians look at the miraculous way God worked in the Bible and say, look at the great faith of those men and women in the Bible. Look at what happened because of their unwavering confidence in certain outcome. Those who are healed, those who are brought back to life from the grave. So if this is how we interpret our view of the biblical faith, of what biblical faith is, then I think the reading from Daniel 3 might even disturb some people. It tells the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, how they stood up to the king Nebuchadnezzar, refusing to bow to the tall golden image, even knowing their lives were at stake. The three men stood on the brink of being thrown into a fiery furnace because of their faith in God and their unwillingness to bow to a false god. They did not pretend to know what was going to happen to them. Although the three had no desire to burn, they did not claim that they would not die. Instead of offering some confident comment because of their great faith, these men simply said, in effect, we really don't know what will happen to us. We only know that we will trust God and obey him. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did claim that God was able to save them and would, in fact, rescue them from the king's hand because they knew that even if they died, they were still in God's hand. But the three faithful men declared, even if God did not save them from the fiery furnace, they would worship him only. Do these words and actions trouble you at all? Perhaps, maybe like some people who were there that day, who may have been there to watch these three men, Perhaps it makes you want to say, oh no, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. No ifs, ands, or buts. Believe without disturbing. 
without delving. But these men did not operate on today's popular notion of what faith should be. This was a biblical faith. So the question asked this morning is, what is faith? Especially in today's day and age, perhaps one way to get a better picture of biblical faith, the kind that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shared, is to explore the question of what biblical faith is not. First, faith is not trust or belief. It can be said that faith is not faith in faith. Many of us quite often, we, we, we link the effectiveness of our faith to how strongly we can convince ourselves that will be a positive outcome to a particular situation. We will decide to let no doubt enter our pumped uh, into our minds. Some of us go through different means to convince ourselves that we have pumped up our faith enough to, for God to honor us and desire us. As we gather here this morning and as we do every Sunday morning, we, we sing and we pray and we read Scripture trying to convince ourselves that we believe as much as is necessary to get God to do what we think is right. But you know, that, that kind of faith is not so much trust in God's wisdom and power as it is confidence in the amount of belief we have made up in an attempt to control Him. Freddie Fritz, who is a Presbyterian minister in the United States, he tells of a story when he was associate pastor. He says, a young husband and father of three preschoolers became ill with Hodgkin's disease. In fact, this was his second bout with the disease. The first bout was conquered some five years earlier. Larry was told by his side of the family that he just needed to have faith again. And the disease would go away. But the disease did not go away. It spread throughout his body and it just got worse and worse. And all the while, Larry was told that he did not have enough faith. If he could just exercise more faith, then the disease would go away. It was a dreadful thing to watch this man succumb eventually to the disease. His family was crushed, and they suggested that Larry died because he did not have enough faith. Well, did Larry die because he did not have enough faith? I don't think so. I don't believe so. And Freddie continues in his story by stating, Larry did not have faith in faith. His faith was in God, and he understood that God's ways were not his ways. But unfortunately, Larry's family did not accept such a view of faith or of God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not have faith in faith. They did not trust in their belief. They didn't really have an idea of what would happen to them. Their faith was not measured by the quantity of belief that they could muster, but by the greatness of their God. Their trust was in God alone. Secondly, faith is not trust in what we want to happen. Although you may begin to see that faith is an expression of utmost confidence in God, it is possible still to believe that God should do what you think he should do. There may have been times when we may have avoided having faith in faith. But have you ever found yourself trusting God to do some very spiritual things that you have decided he needs to do? We all sometimes begin counting on what we would love to happen 
simply because we think it is in God's best interest to make it happen. And why do we do this? Because the results we desire are for God's sake or for what we think will benefit another person. We are convinced that this must occur. I've always enjoyed um, listening and, and the readings in the, of, of Dr. James Dobson. I first found him years ago on the radio with Focus on the Family. That is such a great little series. And uh, I ended up getting a couple of his books. But he does have one book uh, entitled, which I haven't uh, had the opportunity to read yet, but it's called When God Doesn't Make Sense. And it's different stories of people submitted about their experiences along this line. And there is one story in there by uh, Jim Conway, who is a, a pastor and an author. And the story is basically some years ago when his daughter, Becky, she was stricken with cancer. And to save her life, they were going to have to amputate one of her legs. And uh, so Jim writes... The doctor said they would have to amputate one leg to save her life, so the family began to pray, asking God to heal Becky's leg. They knew that God is able to heal, and so they prayed that he would save her leg as a testimony of his love. Because they sincerely desired glory to for God, they believed that God would heal Becky. So strongly did Jim believe that God would honor the family's request that on the day of the scheduled surgery, he asked the doctors to test Becky's leg again before amputating. The surgeon agreed, and the family went to a waiting room, eagerly anticipating the results they were sure would bring great glory to God and great glory to them. Jim later recounted for Moody Monthly what happened. A crowd of friends from the church had come to wait for us and wait with us. So many came, in fact, that they made us leave the waiting room. When the surgeons came out, I knew what he was going to say, and I couldn't face it. I couldn't face my friends, so I ran, I, I ran to the hospital basement where no one would find me, and I cried, I yelled, I pounded my fists against the wall. I felt like the God whom I had served had abandoned me at the hour of my deepest need. Was he so busy answering prayers for parking places that he couldn't see Becky? The story continues describing how this experience devastated Jim, but it also drove him back to the scriptures. There he discovered the problem implicit in a faith that blindly insists on what we would love to happen, even if what we want would seem to honor God. Such a faith is foreign in the Bible. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not have a faith that said that God should act in a certain way. Faith is not trust in what we want to happen. Faith is trust in God. And third, faith, faith is not trust in our ability to read God's will. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego teach us that believers are not more holy because they are certain that such and such will happen or believe that they have identified correctly what God needs to do next. The account of these faithful men stabilizes the related truth that believers are not more faithful when they think they can tell what God will do next. Too often, Christians try to prove their faith to themselves or others by predicting God's actions. Faith of this sort is measured by the conviction with which one speaks out, how God will bless and by the specifications with which the blessing is described. 
Brian Chapel, who is the president of Covenant Seminary in Missouri, tells of a time he attended a prayer meeting in which a woman praised God because he was going to heal her sick dog. She said she knew God would do that because the very day the pet got sick, she just happened to read Psalms 103, verse 3, which says that the Lord heals all your diseases. This could be nothing less than God's providential leading, she said, a way to let her know what he would do. This well-meaning but poorly informed woman had tied her faith to her ability to read circumstances in order to determine how God would act. Unfortunately, these circumstances were about to change. When Brian Chapel next met the woman, she told him that her husband experienced a heart attack during the week following the prayer meeting. Obviously, she surmised, God was not telling me that he would heal my dog when I read the psalm. God was telling me ahead of time that he would heal my husband. Dr. Chapel says that he wondered what the woman would have said if her son got sick on the next day or if what if she had read the next day in Numbers chapter 14, uh, Numbers verse, uh, chapter 14 verse 12 where it says, I will strike them down with a plague. Friends, faith is not trust in our ability to read God's will. It is simple trust in God alone. Great faith does not claim to know what only God can know. It claims only to know the God who knows. So now that we have learned a little of what faith is not, perhaps we should ask the question, well then, what is faith? And it's simply Biblical faith is trust in God alone. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego show us that faith is not trust in our beliefs. It is not trust in what we want to happen, nor is it trust in our ability to read God's secret will. Faith, quite simply, is trust in God alone. Edith Schaefer, who, while she was living on this earth, was a Christian author, she just simply says that we must let God be God. True biblical faith lets God be God. It does not depend upon our efforts or our view of what God should or should not do. It is simply resting upon the truth that God is God. And we can trust him no matter what. You know, the truest test of your faith is when God's answer is no. When there is no healing, when there is no deliverance, when you lose your job, when your loved one never recovers or even dies. And all the while, you have been doing what is right. You're honestly trying to live a life that honors God. You don't have to be a Christian very long before you will find yourself in a tough situation. And even though you pour out your heart to God in prayer, the heavens remain silent. God's answer is no. That is the greatest test. Is your faith still in God when the answer is no? When there is no miracle? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image, image of gold you have set up. Biblical faith is trust in God alone. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego show us that faith is not trust in our beliefs. It is not trust in what we want to happen. Nor is it trust in our ability to read God's secret will. Faith, quite simply, is trust in God alone. So I ask the question, do you have faith? 
or do you have trust? Amen. The Christian life is marked by the offering of one's self to God. In worship, God presents us with the costly self-offering of Jesus Christ, who has claimed us and set us free. In response to God's love in Christ, we offer our lives, our gifts, our abilities, and our material goods for God's service. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. Let us return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth. The offering will now be received.
Let us pray. Blessed are you, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Blessed be God forever. Amen. Please be seated. Let us prepare ourselves to come into prayer as we sing together from Voice United number 400. Lord, listen to your children praying. God, make our lives through Jesus Christ, our true vine, make our lives living branches of faith, hope, and love, so that the existence of others may be enriched and our own lives grow mature with the fruit of the Holy Spirit that spirit given to us by you, our Heavenly Father, and by your Son and our brother, Christ Jesus. Lord, hear our prayer. Gracious, gracious God, help us to be persons who love unconditionally as you love people, who do not place demands or conditions on those whom we accept and equally who do not give up the freedom that Christ won for us by trying to win the love of others or of you by seeking to conform to conditions that they may set upon loving us. Lord, hear our prayer. Caring God for our brothers and sisters, and on all their diverse needs, we also pray this day. We pray with thankfulness for those prayers you have already answered and with hearts of hope for those things yet to be. Hear now the prayers upon our hearts and in the words of our lips. As we come to you now, in silence. Lord, hear our prayers. We ask you, Lord, to be with this congregation as they continue through the transition period. Help them continue to grow and be nourished with your spirit to do your work and to spread your word. We ask you to bless the leaders of the church its ministers, volunteers. Lord, hear our prayer. All these things we pray in the name of Christ Jesus, your Son and our brother and our Lord. Amen.
In the power of the Holy Spirit, we now go forth into the world to fulfill our calling as the people of God, the body of Christ. May the Christ who walks on wounded feet walk with you on the road. May the Christ who serves with wounded hands stretch out your hands to serve. May the Christ who loves with a wonderful, with a wounded heart, open your hearts to love. May you see the face of Christ in everyone you meet, and may everyone you meet see the face of Christ in you. Amen.